uh, welcome to Stratona. And uh, we have uh, uh, we have a Stratona Resident Association meeting, a monthly meeting, and uh, this place every Wednesday. So this time it's a special event. So we are going to have a panel discussion on the future of China. And uh, the panel discussion will 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 start after a, a brief uh, SRE updates. And today we have uh, we have uh, five panelists, and we have special guests guests from the city, and Tom and Helen. Yeah. And uh, today's uh, panelists are. Uh, I have a introduction for <laughs> okay. uh, We have uh, Hain Wei. Uh, Hain is arrived in Vancouver from Hong Kong in 1952 and attended kindergarten at uh, a Good Shepherd Icon Church. <laughs> that was his initial introduction to the community. <laughs> and returned some 20 years later to work with uh, Spota, which uh, was then launching its non-profit housing program. He said the neighborhood connection uh, was working with Ray Camp Community Center in 1978 to 1980. Hain was involved in the early years of a Chinese cultural center and has written about Strakona Chinatown in particular on the community issues of the uh, 1960s and to 1980s. And he worked with federal and provincial government in human rights, multiculturalism, and diversity. More recently, he was a sectional instructor at UBC at the Faculty of Education and School of Social Work, and Hain is a founding member and past president of Chinese Canadian Histori Historical Society of BC. <coughs> um, he was a board member of the Dr. Sun Yassin Classical Chinese Garden and continues the involvement there as a volunteer uh, person. And uh, he's also a brother of Zhou Wei, and who is a passionate and vocal artist uh, 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 activist of, of uh, uh, preserving Vancouver's Chinatown. And we have also uh, uh, Kevin Huang. Kevin Huang has uh, been involved with the uh, Vancouver's Chinatown since 2009. He's an educator of high school and international students, mentor and leadership to you, realizing that there was a growing gap in Chinese Canadian youth engagement on environmental, social, and political issues, and Kelvin co founded the Hua Foundation to increase youth participation and empowerment in local community. And Kelvin currently serves as the executive director of Hua Foundation and uh, spent his time exploring <coughs> intersections between food, culture, and identity. And uh, we also have uh, Andrew Lau. Andrew Lau served on the board of directors at the Chinese Cultural Center of Greater Vancouver, where he is the chair of the uh, Constitution Committee. Andrew also serves as the vice chair uh, to the Chinatown Historical, Hi Historical Area Planning Committee, and working towards the preservation of Chinatown's culture and heritage. He's a uh, ten years uh, to the bar, running his running his uh, legal practice in Vancouver. And uh, we have a uh, billion from uh, Heritage Vancouver Society. Uh, Doris uh, has been working in Vancouver's downtown east side neighborhood since two thousand and eight in uh, community de development, witnessed the growing social issues in Vancouver's Chinatown, particularly around low income Chinese seniors. And uh, Doris co-founded the Youth Collaborative for Chinatown in 2015 to increase youth engagement and in intergenerational activities in Chinatown. If you ever seen them in action, you will probably <coughs> see them playing Maja, young people. Uh, we her fam family roots in one of the uh, one of the Chinatown's largest Chinese playing association. 
Uh, she joined the board of director with her sister, and the sister associated with Julie. Uh, Doris is passionate about supporting Chinatown seniors and social enterprise, and is always looking for uh, more mahjong players in the, in the area. Um, uh, thank you for coming, and please put your hands together for this. I just want to give a quick update about some of the SRA events before we start into the panel discussion. Uh, first of all, I'll be passing around a sign-up sheet, and this is for everybody who is part of the yeah, panel. panel discussion. So the panel discussion, uh, the panelists will have 15 minutes, and then we open up to the floor for another 30 minute Q&A, and then the panelists will have a closing remark. Um, so uh, uh, I would like to ask the first question, uh, uh, and, and Hain, you are a historian, and uh, you know a lot of history, and can you, uh, can you tell us what was the significance of Chinatown, and in the history, how Chicago and Chinatown work together to preserve the neighborhood, and uh, how do you see the future of Chinatown? Thank you very much. Can I just sit down? You want me to stand up? Stand up. Okay. Thank you very much. Just, I'm just pleased and honored to be amongst all of you here today. It's a really wonderful feeling. Yes, I was a cute kid. Okay. <laughs> Came over at age five, and listen, learning the alphabet was difficult for me. But uh, there I was. The Good Shepherd Church was over in Keith Street in those days. I've got lots of show and tell. <laughs> I'm trying to link this up to how this is important, Chinatown Strathcona, to me and to all of us. My parents, um, wedding day, August 1st, 1939, 713 East Georgia Street. The house was torn down during Urban Deal Phase 1. Okay. I want to pay particular attention to this gentleman here, that's my Uncle James. <coughs> This is Uncle James' his induction photograph. He was one of the 700 plus Chinese Canadians that fought for Canada, even though they did not have a right to vote. This is Pender Street, celebration after the war. I think Uncle James and his buddies marched down the street very proudly. I do have vested interests. It's part of our history, my history. It can be also part of your history. This whole area, Chinatown, it's not only for Chinese Canadians, it's for everyone to appreciate the history that's there. It's beyond buildings. You can save the buildings, okay? It's a community, rich with people, with culture, with history to be shared. Otherwise, it's gone. Toronto, it's gone, okay? Aha! I have I, I, I got lots of show and tell. I'm trying to talk specifically between 1960, about 67, 68. A lot of things happened in Vancouver. You see this Chinatown sliced for freeway. That's the uh, headline in the Vancouver Sun, October 17, 1967. Freeway proposal number one. It took four or five years to defeat all the freeway proposals. Freeways, the city planners. The experts said they're good for cities. Vancouver put a stop to that. The citizens here, the citizens of Chinatown, the citizens in Adnac, Granville Woodlands, UBC, um, they stopped the freeways. Okay, but it took a long time. What you can't see here, this is a picture of a well-known architect, Arthur Erickson. He was asked to design cute little stores underneath the freeway. I don't think he did that really all that enthusiastically. But again, it tells you about the power that could have happened to sweep Vancouver into freeways. You want to see more of this? It's in the uh, Museum of Vancouver, okay? the entire freeway system. <coughs> 1967, what else happened in 1968? Uh, it would have been the third and final destruction, bulldozing of Strathcona, where you all live. Phase one, phase two already happened from 1960 to 68. But in 1968, the citizens of Strathcona drew the line in the sand. The formation of the Strathcona Property Owners and Tenants Association. Freeway, the urban renewal will stop, so with the freeway through Prior Street. 
they organized. These are your former residents. They organized and stopped and brought in the rehabilitation program. Uh, I worked for that one year and a half or so on that rehab program. And the houses were made to last another 25 years. It's 40 years now, plus. Good stuff. Um, the board of directors spoke and worked very hard bringing new housing. I do want to acknowledge one person here who was part of that, Patricia. Thank you. <laughs> The organization work collectively to, to build, to communicate, and to bring in nonprofit housing and all that. They looked after the community. So the link between Chinatown and Strathcona, it evolves, it changes. We came in 1952. This was the immigrant area for a lot of Chinese. It was not Chinese until after 1947, 1950, because Chinese were not allowed to come in. So it became more Chinese 1950s and 60s, okay? And now with different ways of immigration, immigrants are arriving in different parts of the city. Chinatown, given social demographics, is changing, facing major socioeconomic challenges with Richmond, with Burnaby, with 41st and Victoria. Those are major challenges. One of the planning of considerations, how do you redefine, how do you still revitalize Chinatown? What's its major asset? It's cultural heritage. <laughs> a lot of shops can't survive alone, but what are the assets that are there that they can build upon? And what's the relationship to you who live in Strathcona? Very important. There are major plans I know underway for a lot of the issues affecting you. Um, discuss them, plan about it, talk about it, and make your voices known. Thank you. We have Bill, and uh, Bill is from uh, Heritage Vancouver. Bill, and I, w and I would like to ask him what is intangible uh, cultural heritage, and why is it important, and, uh, and and why is it important to Chinatown and the broader community, and uh, how intangible heritage is it it is impacted in Chinatown. Should I stand up? Or? <laughs> stand up. <laughs> So hi, um, <clears throat> in, in Tandro, cultural heritage is actually a very complicated item and, and the definitions change a lot depending on who's defining it. Uh, the, the concept of intangible cultural heritage is actually a UNESCO concept. Um, it's not that new, it's over 20 years um, old as a, as a concept, right? So un under UNESCO, the definition is relatively broad but it's very exacting, and, and um, so an example is probably a, a better way of ex describing it. So, for example, um, Capoeira is inscribed as intangible cultural heritage under UNESCO. So Capoeira is this um, Brazilian martial art that is disguised as a dance. Um, and, and what's important about that is that, I mean, there's, there's a very historical significance to it because the, um, uh, the slaves practiced it um, to protect themselves from the colonists. And, um, but how UNESCO looks at that is one important thing is that uh, the transmission aspect of it is quite important. That, that the practice of capoeira is transmitted to um, the next generation and it's practiced that way. So it's not just like viewing it or looking at it, right? Um, if you get to a more local level for, for intangible heritage, like for example, San Francisco, um, their definitions change. Like uh, quite recently, uh, the Filipino community in San Francisco, um, uh, they, they've started to map their intangible heritage and, and that definition sort of um, belongs to the businesses that are important to the Filipino community, the, uh, the places that are important to them, right? So the definition of change, but I think when you ask me what intangible cultural heritage is, I think generally you might really be asking me more, um, what are more contemporary approaches to heritage? I think that's sort of like the more, the better question and, and, and the more important question. And so I think in North America, uh, the, the idea that heritage is um, 
historical and aesthetic is very dominant. So particularly in, in Vancouver, um, this is Strap Kona. Um, so you, your retention zoning reflects that. It's, it's, a, it's a aesthetic perspective on heritage. These homes are beautiful, which they really are. Um, but that's, that, that thinking is really quite dominant and, and it's rooted in, in architecture. Um, there's historical heritage, which is more commemorative, and that's rooted in, in, in history, and that's the area for historians. Um, a more contemporary approach to heritage um, involves, uh, for example, the, the melding of culture and place. Uh, so it's more ecological approach to heritage, which, for example, First Nation, a lot of First Nations uh, societies, they, um, you know, they, they think in that manner where, where the land and, and, and the buildings work together. Um, so that's, that's a, a more contemporary way of looking at it. Uh, I think for you in Chinatown, um, what's important is uh, the relationships between the people and the buildings. Um, and I think it's experts kind of talk about this type of heritage in, uh, in a way that it can't be photographed. So you can photograph a Victorian home and look at it. It, it has the, the brackets, it has the, the nice paint scheme, it has nice architectural features. But this sort of ecological heritage needs to be experienced. So it's very difficult to capture it. Uh, you have to be there and you have to experience it. And, and I think what's important here is that you have an area in Vancouver, in Chinatown, that, where that's very pronounced, that, that, a place where you can have that experience. And um, planning around that has been, I guess, a challenge. It's been challenging in a lot of North American cities. Um, and so I think to, to preserve that um, experience and while, while allowing the city to grow is, is, is kind of... Uh, part of this new form of um, heritage perspective. Um, like, in particular, this, this, until now, I think that with, with the sort of architectural perspectives on heritage, there's been, it's generally, there's been a lot of opposition between development and, and heritage. This, this sort of new perspective, um, newer perspective, um, sort of puts heritage in, in overall planning, it's it's not this separate thing, and 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 you, you use that to take into account like civic needs. For example, here um, Vancouver, there's an affordability issue, there's a housing issue. Uh, there, you know, we're concerned about the environment. Um, how can heritage planning include all of that? Um, and so there's new models around how, how to how to deal with that. So I think. Planning heritage around that is probably quite important if you want to keep these distinct areas in the city. I think I would stop it at that for now. Thank you. Kelvin is the CEO for Hua Foundation, and I know you recently conduct a Chinatown retail study. And uh, how do you see the change in Chinatown food and lands of food access and food security? And Chinatown is going to is going to Chinatown is going to lo uh, to lose its traditional business, and how the situation can be better. Thanks, Will. Uh, so Kevin Wong, uh, executive director at Wa Foundation. Uh, yeah, so as mentioned, uh, we have conducted a study uh, last summer around the uh, food security scene in, in Chinatown. And through our work, uh, ever since our previous organizing in Shark Street, we have been engaging the Chinese businesses, especially restaurants and green grocers, on sustainability. But as, that, as we learn more about the history of the food system locally, we are dealing with two parallel food systems side by side. And what that means is, from the entire economic chain, from growers to fishermen to distributors to importers, it's actually quite separate. So you have the mainstream, and then you have the Chinese one. 
And looking into history, this fracture started way back in the 1920s. So after the railway, after the gold mine, uh, a lot of uh, Chinese uh, settlers uh, weren't allowed to settle anywhere else. So they settled in Chinatown. And they did what they knew how to do, which was farm. So in 1921, Chinese farmers were actually producing 90% of British Columbia's fresh produce. So it's significant, 90%. Uh, and due to lobbying efforts by the white farmers, uh, they had the government institute the Vegetable Marketing Act in 1927. So forced all fresh produce sales and trade to go through a marketing board. And of course the Chinese did not have the power, whether it's economic, political, or other, and social capital, to compete with that. So that's to really curtail that entire distribution network. And we have Produce Rope, which was actually born out of Chinatown, still in existence. And due to that Vegetable Marketing Act and uh, following racist policies, such as like the barbecue meats uh, by the health authorities in the 1970s and 80s, uh, it really continued to reinforce uh, this way of segregation and racist policy through racist policies. So this is how the system is still in existence to this day. And on our work portfolio, which is around food security, it's astounding to us that we're not engaging millions of dollars of the local economy and thousands of jobs. And with the light of all these changes happening in Chinatown, uh, our food security report uh, looked into the losses of these traditional businesses. And it has been over 50% over the past six years. Uh, we're left with around four or five green grocers, uh, two fishmongers left, uh, and we have other data around restaurants as well as dry goods stores. Uh, that really presents a challenge for us as a system to see, figure out how we can provide uh, food justice and food access for all, because food justice also has a lens around culturally appropriate food. You don't want to be forcing people to eat food that they are not comfortable or grew up with, not to not grow up with. So for us, uh, when there has been nearly 100 years of segregation of the food system, what type of challenges does that present for us if we're not looking at how we can preserve these businesses? And going back to some of the points that were already raised around intangible assets as well as historic preservation, and I argue that food is a cultural practice. So how do we make sure that's going to be in existence for future generations to have that opportunity to engage on? Uh, so just in closing before I get into food. Questions down the line. Uh, I'm an immigrant settler, first generation Taiwanese. I have no connections to Chinatown historically. However, I grew up eating Chinese food because my mom cooked it every single day. And where did that Chinese food come from? It's parallel food system. So, what do I and who do I have to thank for that opportunity on what made me feel at home growing up this whole time? So, thank you. And next we have Doris. Doris has uh, has very passionate in engaging uh, both the uh, seniors and youth. And both seniors and youth that uh, have been mentioned in the uh, in the Vancouver's Chinatown neighborhood plan. And can you tell us more about it and uh, and uh, what can be done to advance this uh, aspect of the plan? And uh, what would be the challenge? Hi everyone. Um, I think when when we're really talking about housing and in Chinatown's context of it, it's about seniors housing um, that we really talk about it in sheer numbers units there's 25 units being offered in this building this new development um, these are how many units are needed for seniors and I think it really strips away all the well, one, dignity, um, but also the social aspects of housing. And a community is made up of more than just housing. And I think that's really why, why the community has really rallied um, in recent, the past couple years around 105 Keeper, uh, a new development being proposed. And thank you, SRA, for writing a, a letter of opposition to that project. Um, and I think it really, we're at this point of really getting at the crux of what we want to see in our community. And it's really hard to, you know, as Bill was talking about intangible cultural heritage, it's really hard to 
get into those nuances. And, um, and for me, it's really that 25 units in a building is not enough for how many of a percentage because we really need a complete community. It's about the housing and it's about the care. It's about the public spaces. It's about the retail and where we can shop and affordable food. It's about all those things. And so, but policy tends to kind of segregate those pieces out and doesn't look at it as a whole. And I think that's really problematic. And, you know, to adopt what Bill was saying about this ecological approach, how can we shape policy to look at an ecolog at, at the community in an ecological way that thinks about intergenerational, not just about seniors, but also about students that need housing? What about daycare and, and having that kind of multifaceted approach? Um, so for, for us, um, we really, as Youth Collaborative for Chinatown, um, we really want to see a community of intergenerational care, and that's where our approach is really um, trying to demonstrate that. So we use kind of the exper experiential cultural transmission um, of heritage as a way to care for seniors. So we run a monthly mahjong. It's just games, but it's also about caring for our seniors to create a public space for them to be able to hang out and socialize with people of, of other ages. Um, we run a Saturday school program that is about the Cantonese language, and it's so that young people can, and, and Chinese and non-Chinese people can learn Cantonese to be able to relate with the Chinese seniors in the neighborhood. And, and in that way, we're creating a, a community of care in, in that little way. Um, and at the same time, passing on those cultural practices or um, cultural, those cultural heritage pieces. So I think, yeah, just to, just to say that, I think we really need to think about Chinatown and Strathcona and any neighborhood, wherever you're from, um, as a complete community, not just, not just pieces of it. How, how do you envision the future of Chinatown and under the current and the proposed development policy? Is there any alternative can achieve better social security? Thank you everybody for having us all here. It's great to see so many people care about the community to unite together to defend the community. Chinatown right now is at a crossroads. It is on the brink of destruction. What the city is proposing is a mass rezoning of Chinatown, such that existing buildings will be torn down to re be replaced by massive condos. We're talking condos at 150 feet in height, 200 foot frontages. When we're talking 200 foot frontages, this is the frontage of a Walmart, of a Best Buy, of a Canadian Tire. So we have to ask ourselves as a community, is that what we want to see to happen no. to Chinatown? No! no. no. No weapon way. No. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> he says what I can't say. <laughs> um, now, but the most troubling aspect about the proposed policy, the proposed inclusionary zoning policy, is this. It's the fact that rezoning decisions will be made outside of public hearings at city council. It will be made by the city planning department by the bureaucrats. What this means is that the people making decisions to rezone Chinatown are not subject to democratic pressures, of electoral pressures. So the community's voices will in effect mean nothing because the city planners are not up for re-election. City planners do not have to think about the, uh, the needs of the community. No matter what, they're gonna have their job next year. Where a city council, they have to care about the community's views. They have to care about your views. If it goes through the city planning department instead of city council, the voices of the community will not be heard, no matter how egregious that development becomes. Now, what's going to happen once all of these new condominiums come up? What's going to happen once Chinatown is mass rezoned and destroyed? This is what's going to happen. Property values will drastically increase. Property taxes, in turn, will drastically increase. This will be passed on to businesses that rent. This will be passed on to residents that rent. And what's going to happen to these existing businesses and residents? 
they're going to be pushed out because they can no longer afford these increased rents. They can no longer afford these increased property taxes. Now, what this amounts to is that, is that word, that word that we all dislike. It amounts to gentrification. That's what this is about. Now, there's going to be a mass displacement of the community. We're talking low-income seniors. We're talking people of limited means. We're talking people of limited language skills that do not have the network or the education to go out there to reestablish themselves elsewhere. Chinatown is their home. Chinatown is the end of the line for them. And without Chinatown, they could end up on the street. We're talking about these respected seniors that we see in front of us right now. Do we want them on the street? No, no we do not. Now, the inclusionary zoning policy is a plan that makes it easier for the city to develop Chinatown, to turn it into a commodity for profit. But where is the plan to take care of the seniors? Where is the plan to take care of the low income? It simply does not exist. And I think that is grossly unjust. Would you all agree about that? Yeah. 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 Now, it is important to note that the city does have a plan such that if a building is above 90 feet in height, there's going to be 20% social housing. But when we're talking about 200 foot frontages, it takes up half a city block. Each building is going to only have about 10 to 20 social housing units. Right now we have about 900 low income seniors, 900 low income members of, of the community. Those 10 to 20 units per half city block is going to be grossly insufficient. Moreover, this is very important. Although we do have that 20% social housing, which is grossly insufficient, during that time of the demolition of Chinatown, during that time it takes for those new units to come up, for those social housing units, which are insufficient to come up, where are these seniors, where are the community members going to reside? There is no plan for that. So we have a plan to destroy Chinatown, but not a plan to take care of the community. And that's wrong. That's wrong. We cannot let that happen as a community. The inclusionary zoning policy must fail. And we must band together as a community to ensure that it fails. Thank you all for having me here. Everybody, now we open up the, uh, to the floor. Uh, questions for.